From the threads of lunaticoutpost.com, this is Lopsided Discussion. This week's thread topic, the Fukushima nuclear disaster. I am Liberty. I am Ecaf Roy. And I am Entropy. And we appreciate you tuning in and listening to the show today. I'm not so sure about this being an engineered or whatever accident, but uh, th- there's a lot of damning evidence that TEPCO tried to uh, cover this up and mishandled everything um, immediately following the uh, tsunami. Um, what do you know about that? I know that uh, initially the evacuation zone was really small. I think it was like four square miles. They definitely didn't uh, evacuate far enough. And then there was the, I don't even know if this is real. I watched the video, but I don't speak uh, Japanese. But the cat was saying stuff like, uh, if you smile, you will not be affected by the radiation. Did you guys hear any of that? <laughs> I don't think that worked. <laughs> that sounds kind of like if you play hide and go seek and close your eyes, nobody can see. Right. Yeah, I couldn't tell if it was a troll video or not. It was just, uh, it seemed official, like always, on the internet. And uh, the guy's like, happy people do not get <laughs> affected by radiation. Smile. I was like, but of course it was all, you know, uh, subtitles. <laughs> no, they definitely... Uh tried to save face. I mean, that's a cultural hang up with them. Um, I think it was just, you know, not given the proper attention because they didn't want that much attention put on it. Uh, they definitely dragged their feet on a few things. And But then again, you may want to point fingers at GE and the lobbyists within that company uh, for making them take the reactors of that model, which, and it's all hearsay, but from what I've read, um, they didn't want any reactors in the first place, and their first choice of reactor did not involve this, what some people call obsolete design. And if you think about it, putting the cooling pool on the second floor just doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense unless you're trying to keep everything in a small footprint for profit reasons. The video that I watched, they uh, put the, the pulls at the top, they said, for uh, to help the automation in removing them. Right, uh, keeping the footprint small. Yeah. So you got to jack it up a level so you can fit more on the land that you know, you've got set aside, which is hard Perfectly. to do in the first place. Yeah. So that that's a capitalistic motivation to say the least oh yeah we've got problems with that in the states where whenever a regulation came up that uh, one of the nuclear plants was up nuclear plants was up against they would lobby congress and then they would get that regulation changed rather than go in and maintain their equipment properly yeah that is uh, across the board in the power industry, uh, I had the pleasure of working in a laboratory that um, did the fly ash mer- uh, mercury analysis on the fly ash that came out of a, a local coal burning uh, power plant. And I watched the EPA regulation or the uh, parts per billion that was allowed in something like that go up after one uh, yearly cycle or whatever. And it kind of, I was starting to get into the conspiracy uh, mindset, and I started looking into it, and it turns out that there was a contract up for uh, a dirty uh, coal plant, meaning it had lead and mercury and, at, you know, uh, not pleasant amounts. And there was enough. You you there? You dropped out there for a second, ECAF. Uh, are you there, E? Entropy? Uh, yes, I'm still here. Cool. I think we yeah. lost. Yeah, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll get him back uh, here soon. And just, 
I know that uh, the Japanese government had a uh, study after the disaster in which uh, roughly, you know, so many hundred scientists got together. And they did conclude on the, the points that uh, were hit on the design of the power plant that the power plant was not designed um, in any way to be prepared for a tsunami or any sort of natural disaster uh, similar to that. Um, so it was definitely old technology. You know, they put it right there on the beach. And they didn't take the proper precautions for the location that they did it at. You there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. So we're going to log out and restart Skype and then uh, log right back in. So what have we uh, not covered? when it comes to the Fukushima disaster. We haven't really talked about Chernobyl and what we know about the long-term effects of such a site. Um, the, United, the UN Scientific Committee uh, tested the Japanese workers and determined that there were no clinically observable effects of radiation exposure. Now, that's kind of extreme in my view. Uh, to come to that kind of conclusion uh, because we all know that there was definitely a huge meltdown and a massive release of radiation um, that even went out to uh, to international waters. Um, do you think that the UN scientific committee is covering up the uh, or helping to cover up the magnitude of the Fukushima disaster? Personally, I don't think they have any interest in telling the truth for the sake of, you know, the truth. Uh, so I'm sure there's some things being left out. You, numbers can be, you know, swayed one way or the other. Um, and as far as the, uh, the ocean uh, is concerned, we've got so many situations muddying up that data set that how can you really contribute this, that, or the other thing as far as ecological ramifications down the, you know, food chain, attribute that to Fukushima and not attribute it to the, you know, BP disaster or the garbage patch or, you know, the plastic particulates. Um, yeah. So I don't think they have anything, you know, usable uh, as far as information. They're definitely not the people you go to for the breaking news, the UN. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, uh, to touch base on the exposed workers, I was watching some video, and I mean, they were in there for a full year, all up around the site with your basic hazmat suit on, uh, which seems ridiculous to me. I mean, they were actually, like, within touching distance of the buildings, so that's, I don't know that much about it, so it's an educated guess to say that they're definitely well, fudging the numbers. They did have a... Uh um, a rotating cycle of workers and depending on how close you were that would dictate how long you could stay in a zone and then your time would be done now I don't know if that was like an ongoing thing or if they ran out of people by now um, you know to just have one off exposures to the situation um, I know they can't use robots because of all the interference we don't apparently have anything that'll um, withstand that much radiation and still be able to control it um, reliably. Yeah, I hear you. Um, yeah, that'd be tough. You'd almost have to do that with magnets or something because, I mean, I mean, the amount of lead that you would have to wrap that shit in and you'd have to have it tethered, I imagine, because it would destroy any Wi-Fi signal. Again. Well, our spacecraft uh, encounter radiation out in the solar system, um, they're shielded against it. Why can't NASA help build a robotic uh, worker to go in there? And, you know, is it is it a problem with the remote controlling of it? Does the radiation interfere with the signal? Um, I think the the concern, the main concern was you can't 
the no cameras will function you just it's just being bombarded with uh you know the different radiation yeah yeah and as far as the um solar radiation and what's coming off of the uh exposed you know rods at fukushima i don't i know 100 percent if we're dealing with the exact same wavelength of of radioactive emissions right but i don't know has there has there been a publicly published accurate estimate of the solar contamination around the plant as far as how much radiation is in the soil? I've That's seen, not something I know. Go ahead. Uh, I've seen the do it yourselfers the vids on uh, YouTube with people walking around and picking up gnarly background readings like thirty, forty, fifty of whatever magnitude that they measure that by when it should be like like a point something point zero something but I have I don't know uh, about a, an official recount what do you think Gav? I have not seen anything um, as far as mainstream media everything's anecdotal um, you know the the YouTube vids and whatnot um, but I know that there was concern about the food supply um, as far as the grass going into the cow and the milk and then the end result of the, of the, uh, the focus of the article was the radioactive level of uh, milk in, in that area. Um, so I, again, I don't think it's something that they're drawing attention to even though there's a lot of independent people out there with their own blogs and, you know, equipment trying to make a ruckus, but you can't, you know, <clears throat> they're not metaphorically loud enough to be heard amongst all the, you know, chaff on the internet. Yeah. Signaled noise. I remember reading one report that said that the, uh, the soil contamination um, around the Fukushima plant was showing to have radiation levels less than what naturally occurs in the city of Denver, Colorado. Um, any truth to that, or is that just a uh, hyperbole? Hmm. That's interesting. Well, Denver being high up and maybe just accumulating from the normal, uh, you know, weather patterns. Uh, ever, those, there's, uh, uh, Denver right. actually has a, a radiation uh, from uh, uranium uh, that's in the soil. There's naturally actually occurring. Yeah, uh, there's a natural deposits of uranium in the soil around Denver, Colorado, from what oh, I understand. Shit. Yeah. But Denver also has a normal uh, cancer rate. But I was figuring that there was probably some some uh, some stuff left over, some pollution left over from the tests that they did in uh, you know in Nevada. I'm sure that poisoned the heck out of the, uh, most of the northern United States. Let that me way. backtrack. I'm not sure that Denver has a normal cancer rate. Um, I'm going by memory here. But, uh, but I do know that, uh, that that report was published saying that there was less radiation in Fukushima soil than, than in Denver. Um, you were talking about these uh, lobbyists uh, earlier and how they affect policy, you know, on these stuff. The Fukushima and the Chernobyl uh, nuclear power plants were older generation uh, nuclear power plants. Uh, are the newer generation nuclear power plants safer? Well, that's a different, I think they're moving over to pellets um, rather than rods. Um, I think that is supposed to be inherently safer um, but I'm not 100% sure. The one thing about nuke plants that I can tell you is everything in there, every valve, every gauge, every pipe, there's four, at least four of them in a redundant system. Um, but the overall design of the things don't take into consideration an event like uh, the tsunami where it was a lack of external power to keep the um, pumps flowing into the, you know, the... Heat exchanger? Uh, 
well, the pool where the old rods were. Uh, I think they, or if it all happened at once, uh, as far as power uh, going down to all elements of the plant, um, there could have been rods still engaged, and that might be the case. But I think the early on, I remember the concern being the uh, the old the the old rods in the uh, the pool in the second level was draining and just you know basically running away with their reaction. Is that what caused the explosion at the number four? Those explode. I don't know. They, the, there's a lot of steam pressure, and that could have just been you know a, right. a, a subcomponent or something. I don't know if it was an actual you know fission event or or whatever. Yeah, I, I believe I believe you're correct. I believe that did it. It was a steam pressure kind of explosion. Well, but there were the four buildings and. Uh, they had explosions as they fell on successive days after that um, and from what I understand it was the steam they boiled off all the water to keep it cool um, without that water to keep it cool even though they had engaged like the safety system you know put the rods in there to, to uh, reduce the reaction or to stop the reaction it, it heated up to like over 2,000 degrees uh, without the water to cool it off, at least at the where it was active. Now, building four, it had stored in its upper pools um, like enough used rods for all four reactors. It was like a couple years worth. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> and that's and building four is essentially the problem. The worst problem because it's got all the spent rods that the, there were failures throughout the system that like you said the main problem being that the, the power grid went down um, three of the reactors if i recall correctly had diesel generator backup for their cooling systems pump the water through there and uh then like those ran for 24 hours and then they failed um and the one that, that didn't have a generator, it had like a passive heat exchange system where it would just pump the hot water up through a, like a, a cooler that had like water in it. And as it passed through there, then in a closed system, it would cool the, the stuff off. And of course, that all went to hell. Yeah, let, well, let's discuss, you know, the design element for a second. Let's say that they were updated um, reactors that had a constant relief of taking away uh, used up rods or whatever fuel they're using and they didn't have them on site. Some people uh, you know speculate that it's worse because there were all those used rods you know next to a core that would be you know running away with itself. Um, so let's just for a second say that there were no rods in the pools. There was uh, all the old material had been shipped off. If that lessened the situation at Fukushima now, unfortunately, the end result of that system working is the lowest uh, bidding contractor comes, you know, it's usually a foreign uh, country from where the uh, material was taken and they're contracted with responsibly disposing of said material. If they do it by the book, it gets buried or put into, you know, salt mines or something, just kind of yeah. stashed, stashed away, out of sight, out of mind. If it's not handled properly, then you end up with the situation of Somali pirates, where foreign entities would just dump radioactive material and other uh, industrial waste off the coast of Somalia because there was no distinguishable government to say no. And then you've got the fishermen who watch their um, livelihood die off, rent out some hired guns to chase these guys away. The hired guns come back to the warlord say, hey, there's a bunch of cool shit out there. And poof, radioactive Somali pirates. And that's from a you know, a responsible removal of, you know, all of this, whether it's uh, nuclear or, um, you know, just standard industrial waste. So the whole whole system's broken all over the place. Yeah, I hear you. That's a sanctioned, regulated disposal attempt. 
And uh, like you said, they store this stuff in, in uh, salt domes, which, of course, I live in Texas, right next to Louisiana and that whole problem that they're having there. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I feel the effects of that, too. And I'm scared to think of where all the, like, toxic waste from just industry ended up. I'm sure that's got... We've, we've probably got a bunch of underground underwater dumping spots that are just ridiculous the goddamn lake right next to me people dump batteries in like car batteries like enough yeah. that it almost reached the top of the lake by the dam <laughs> it's like wow and people well, still fish right there let's bring it into pop culture for a second the um the reboot of uh teenage mutant ninja turtles that every nerd an 80s kid is bitching about uh, they removed the origin story so now the turtles are going to be from space for some reason but in my opinion the whole moral of that cartoon and the, what made it great was it was uh, corporate greed and, and pollution that's where the mutagen came from and that's where the turtles you know mutated into their awesome ninja fighting state but now with the reboot, you're going to have an entire generation lost to that fact, not even thinking about the fact that corporations do a bunch of crazy stuff and then just dump it in the sewer. And that's common practice. So you've got, you know, the whole media cover up kind of just, you know, slow broil effect. Rewriting history hmm. of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but still. Yeah. You know, it's it's the social impact that it uh, brought with it. It being a cartoon, showing yeah. kids from a young age, watch out, there's bad things in the world. And there's also secret societies. I mean, the Foot Clan and Shredder, that was a mafioso, Yakuza kind of secret society. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Hip them at a young age. That's why we're so <laughs> smart. <laughs> well, you can't say anything bad about corporations. You know? It's just... It's Way this when, works. No, because they're people, and you'll right. get you'll get sued for slander. <laughs> but the oceans have really taken a beating. I mean, if you think about how long that BP oil rig, you know, just spewed all that stuff out, and then all the chemicals that they threw in there to clean it up, then you got Fukushima going on. You know, a lot of this stuff goes into uh, to migration um, territory with sea life. And uh, I think that we're going to, I think we've damaged the oceans a lot more than we realize. Well, you've got all the weird behavior. There's all those little sea lion pups, like 500 of them off the coast of um, Southern Same California. Here. And uh, whether they were abandoned or whether the adults died, or nobody knows what's going on there. You got the, the mega pods, super mega ultra uber pods of, <laughs> of dolphins. Um, you know, where are they going? Are they just uprooting and, you know, migrating to a, another situation because everything's so screwed up? Or do they not? I mean, if the ocean, if that's your, if you're trying to get away from pollution, there's really nowhere else to go. Eventually, it's going to catch up with you. So sea life are kind of screwed in that regard. I agree. Considering how they handled the BP spill and uh, the, the, like the shroud of secrecy behind it they wouldn't let people fly over it they wouldn't let the coast guard out there everything's underwater we got to take their word for stuff and these are yeah. corporations <clears throat> that whole corrects it thing that just it emulsified the uh the top slick and dragged it down to the point where nobody can track it right mm -hmm. out of sight out of mind yeah and that's assuming that it's even capped off. I mean, there are rumors. I know we're kind of getting a little off topic, but um, on the grand scheme, this is pertinent. The, uh, the rumors that they didn't actually ever cap that thing, that there were actually two pipes, and they had the video cameras on, like, the small one. And they got that one capped. They covered it with concrete. But there's suspicions that there was a much larger... Uh, drilling spot that they weren't able to cap and they just got the hell out of there and it is it is screwing things up it's like affecting the jet stream all kinds of weird stuff jet stream 
I, I think it's a jet stream. I'll probably have to cut that part out and post. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, I believe it, uh, it. It's affecting the the current that whips around Florida and drags all that warm water up the coast, mm -hmm. which to at the, some point would have some effect on the the air currents above it, whether you know directly or indirectly. But it definitely the emulsified oil uh, with the Corexit. Imagine a gigantic, you know. Manhattan-sized uh, frog egg sack just kind of drifting around in the lower currents. Um, there was evidence, or you know, maybe it was doctored, who the hell knows, it's the internet. But from what I could tell, there was evidence that the, uh, the current system got clogged up for a little while there. And most likely, it was the emulsified Corexit and, and raw oil. So it's, it's like screwing with the timing on your car, and eventually it's gonna just backfire and not run anymore. <laughs> well, unless well, let's let's just say that your car doesn't have the uh, sentient credibility that Gaia does. Let's let's assume for a second that it's a, a thriving, self-correcting system. Then there's not a hell of a lot we could do save, uh, you know, a nuclear winter to really muck things up. But even then, time heals pretty much everything. And I think that this is probably a logical way to bring this into the picture, how you would think after these enormous problems that they're having with this stuff that, you know, the, the natural outcome would be to question their motives to figure out if there's other ways to do things. I'm sure the money that we're spending on defense we could probably build way more efficient energy stuff than we are probably in one year's worth of their budget but the fact that we can't institute any type of recourse for these problems that they're having i mean sure they fired some guy at bp but i mean christ they ran ads on youtube for like three solid months every time you turned around there was a bp ad telling you how awesome they were and that they're so sorry oh yeah. well that's why they have that whole corporations or people thing now they have the illusion of having responsibility for stuff but it actually keeps the people that make decisions in that corporation from really taking any responsibility for anything. It protects them. It's a buffer. Well, it's also not just the corporations. you got the governmental bodies like the NRC <clears throat> in America, uh, Nuclear Regulatory Com Commission. They get crazy amount of funding from licenses and not just licenses from the actual facilities uh, having uh, with the reactors, but the supporting infrastructure, uh, the test facilities that have nuclear dedication de uh, departments, they need to be licensed in order to do what they do to uh, um, verify the um, uh, chain of uh, equipment from vendor to um, to the reactor itself. There's a whole string of self um, is self-interest as far as money and it, it stems from a lot of bureaucratic uh, behemoths that we have attached to the energy um, industry. This is Entropy from Lunatic Outpost and you're listening to Lopsided Discussion on Biased Propaganda Radio. Do you think the energy industry tries to use these uh, tragedies to keep, I guess, safe nuclear power from being utilized more research into fusion, thorium, pellets, you know, things like that, because it looks to me like the, the more you keep the old technology up and you make things look like they're going to fail, they're not safe, the more you can keep your own product on the market. And uh, I was just wondering, do, does the oil and uh, coal lobbies have any impact? influence over our uh, nuclear regula regulation and um, what uh, we can look into as far as nuclear power in the future? Well, it's the same, it's the same folks. The, pa the people who have the oil wells, the people who have the coal mines, also have uranium mines. Right. It's all, it all comes from the same end, you know, vendor. So they're, they're going to sell their most profitable product not necessarily the safest one. spread it around make as much money as you can and whatever regulatory system you have in a region that dictates what 
one, you know, which product you're going to sell. Gotcha. Yeah, there seems to be some alternatives. This is probably way off in woo woo land, but uh, I was always interested in cold fusion, which is pretty much like a chemical fusion, you know, less uh, at room temperature, pretty much. It's like uh, palladium and uh, peroxide and some other stuff. And I've seen, like, of course, the YouTube videos, God only knows about that. I heard there were like 200 units operating in Russia. Of course, I've never seen anything about that afterwards. And probably the most devious twist to that plot was, uh, I don't have the exact facts right in front of me, but as I, there were two scientists that worked on it in Utah, and they... Um, published their information and it was like a big boom um, everybody was excited that wasn't a scientist everybody that was a scientist said burn them get get them out of here now because they are that is crap that's going to screw up our system we've got a lot invested in it. it's like ecap said we've got a, a whole platform a whole you know structure that we we use all this stuff with and uh just like everybody that comes up with an alternative to petroleum uh, one of the guys was beat to death in front of his house and uh, he still had his wallet, still had his watch, everything like that. Um, I don't think anything happened to the other scientist. I think he booked and went to Switzerland or something. But like that was the one and only time it really came out in America and it was met with some serious crap. And to go back further, um, like Rudolf Diesel, of course, he, he his idea was to make a, a machine that farmers could use to grow their own fuel with, to keep it, you know, cost down and be efficient. And, and the side benefit to that was that it was uh, less pollution and stuff like that. With it, like, I think it was a 1900 World Fair. He brought a diesel engine that ran on mineral oil, one that ran on vegetable oil, um, and I think he brought one that ran on diesel too. And of course he was, you know, changing the way the world burned fuel. And last I heard, and of course this is conspiracy theory land but uh he died mysteriously on a boat like he just vanished off the boat one night and uh, they never found his body that seems to be the trend with anybody who tries to bring something different to the table well i think the scientific community if there were any credible reports i'm not seeing any, but that doesn't say that there there isn't any out there you know if there's anything uh like cold fusion that works I think that would be exciting for science. I think it would be something that uh, scientists would uh, would want. But you got to remember that uh, a lot of scientists work for people. You know, they're paid by the corporations that employ them. Um, if something like free energy were to come along, I can see where they would consider it a threat to uh, to national security and to the economy because it would uproot the entire economic structure of having to go and buy your energy from somebody. You yes, unfo unfortunately that's a wrong-headed way of thinking about it because it's putting the you know few above the many. Exactly. When, and, and you go down that road and it just, we, we end up in a corner like we have right now where you have to keep doing it and otherwise, you know, the, the deeper you go, the more if you let go, it, the, the harder it, we're all going to fall. So, I mean, can it even be done in a, uh, a very gradual, like, could you bring something like zero point energy, a little, you know, module on everybody's house, on everybody's car, could you gradually bring that in and displace the old way of doing things? Or does it have to be a, you know, dissolving of the old structure in order for a new, you know, something new to grow? I think, I've got a view on that. I think, uh as the internet grows and the information gets out there, we've got more DIY people um, and they drop out of, you know, as they get things figured out, as they get the solar put up, as they get uh, various forms of alternate energy, they just drop off the grid. And that's pretty much, you, you almost have to do that. You almost have to be smart enough to run your own gear uh, to make that drop. You know, there's a learning curve that you have to, to do. It's like buying a, a car that you're going to work on instead of taking it to the mechanic to get fixed. Um, so I think that's probably, if nothing else, I think that's definitely going to be like the natural scale of replacement as people get smarter, realize that not only are they impacting the earth in a negative way, 
they're also sending money out of the country, having negative effects on not only our economic stuff, but also, you know, wars and stuff like that. So it's like any way to get out of that, um, I think people, as they get wiser and uh, learn to use the Internet better and get more free time to do all this stuff, um, that'll probably be the slow way to do it. The fast way to do it would be the, you know, the Robert Oil Barons buy up all the technology just as soon as it comes out like Google and Java and Flash and all those guys do and just swallow it up until they run out of resources, they run out of petroleum or there's such a natural catastrophe that they can no longer keep, you know, maintain that direction and uh, they're going to have to let some of the secrets out of the bag. Well, the plutocracy to keep you on the grid, you know, that that's not only Washington, D.C. These companies influence our local governments too. Uh, there's been three lawsuits, uh, one in California, one in uh, Pennsylvania, and one in Missouri, where um, the lobbyists for the energy companies went to town hall and tried to get them to pass legislation against people having solar panels on their homes and stuff like that. And uh, I know the case in Missouri was uh, was one back in uh, June of 2012 by the homeowner um, when the city tried to stop her from... Uh, from you know getting off the grid and using their own power so you got to watch these folks they're everywhere yeah that's ridiculous they used to give tax incentives for people to put up solar power and stuff and it's the same damn thing it's like this oil or these uh, energy companies it, it's almost like they're the mafia you know it's like for example in California I think it was Los Angeles they had a, a large trolley system just like they do at San Francisco and the petroleum company out there bought it and decommissioned all the trolleys so everybody would have to drive. You know, it's like, wow, thanks, guys. That was the theme to uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Was it? <laughs> that, was the, that was the plot. Wow, that's pretty deep for uh, that movie. I guess I just remember <laughs> Jessica Rabbit's boobs or something. I'm not sure. Yeah, you got to look at the right hand while the left hand is holding boobs. <laughs> That's tough, but I will try. <laughs> so, what about uh, like alternatives? I've got one specifically in mind. We've had trouble uh, kind of rectifying the solar energy output versus get back as far as as much as it costs. But they're making pretty decent headway in changing that technology. And uh, my personal favorite is uh, magnetic energy. I'm pretty sure that that's going to replace all forms of combustion once we can come together as a society and realize that we need to do some think tanking and get around this. I think we'll eventually migrate to uh, magnetic energy. If we put half as much research into that as we did petroleum, I mean, it would be free energy, which was why Tesla had such a problem because as soon as R.J. Reynolds found out that he was trying to make free energy for everybody he crapped on the project basically shut him down and that was the end of tesla's run and i, I think, think that was morgan jp morgan i oh, think oh right rg reynolds yeah <laughs> <laughs> let me move this cigarette pack <laughs> <laughs> subliminally influence me but all those ta all those patents that are still locked up under national defense from tesla that's I mean that that's going to be viewed as a war crime at some point in the future, because if he did, if he wasn't who everybody in the conspiracy theory you know realm claim he was, if he if he didn't come up with all these things uh, that would have changed the world, and he wasn't stifled by banksters, why so many patents still locked up? I mean, what's going on there? And the problem, uh, the the thing that Tesla really. Um, promises for me and personally is a way to utilize all the technologies we have right now as far as power accumulation um, and try to get rid of the battery aspect of it because all that lithium and all that extra uh, um, rare you know uh, rare earth metals those are still coming from mines in third world countries of little kids in ragged clothes, you know, digging rocks out of the ground. 
And that that's a problem, no matter you know how you look at it. Whether it's saving, you know, it's not going to save the planet. It'll pr- maybe save you know one of the hemispheres, but the other hemispheres are going to go to shit. Agreed. Yeah, and um, and that's just the next medium for the like extortion practices that the robber barons are putting on us. It's like. They're going to run out of... I mean, they've got it figured out. I'm sure they probably had this figured out since the 50s that the next logical step was going to be these batteries. But I think you're right as if we try and bypass the battery because that's always going to be a toxic mess. And like you said, the environmental impacts and the societal impacts you know, from the places we're getting this stuff from because it's all going to come from uh, uh, Afghanistan. Every, everyone. <laughs> well, there's a huge uh, vein, like a $17 billion... Uh, vein of lithium in Afghanistan. Yeah, and all the Coltran comes from the Congo, which is all run by rebels and warlords and slave practice. Yeah, I've seen some documentaries on that stuff, and that's some, some heinous stuff. So if you eliminate all these uh, rare earth metals needed to, you know, hold the charges that you're accumulating with let's say solar and wind if you eliminate the need and you just have the live um, current coming directly from the solar panel directly from your you know windmills or micro windmill farm or whatever you got going on if there were a base flow of electricity from let's say Tesla's you know vacuum just pulling energy or, or current from the vacuum of, of space and even if that technology in order to make mass producible you had to sacrifice some of the power capabilities if you had an all you know a, tr- a trinity of power accumulation solar vacuum and wind in every you know domicile property or whatever then you you know, let's say all the banksters just die off and nobody's fighting for the use of fossil fuels anymore. I mean, within one generation, you've got a whole new culture, whole new, possibly on the road to a new species. And definitely a healthier attitude because we're not sitting here uh, ineffectually thinking about what we're doing destroying things. You know, we've as a species taking that step forward to to to, to fix that to to uh, reconcile what we did and i think that's going to have a pretty strong impact on on our psychology as a species and it's going to draw us away from the animal mentality of forage and you know nomadic you know move to the next place forage that move to the next place and adopt more of a like a, a plant mentality of you're in a system you want to be uh, symbiotic with everything around you want to recycle your own stuff because that's that's stability that's gonna live a long time and the animal mentality is uh, as we can see destroying not only us but the earth in my opinion well we have to eliminate the concept of surplus as far as you know back in the day when everybody was hunter-gatherer then you know a couple of communities figured out that uh, the seeds that they drop one, you know, last year in that same spot when they come back around again, there's, uh, you know, more things planted. So then you start agriculture. Then once you have agriculture, uh, you end up with something surplus. So now one group has a surplus of X and the other groups have a lack of X, but maybe they have a surplus of Y, so you have trade. But then all of that miscommunication, you end up, you know, down the line warring at, at some point. So in the modern version of that, you've got people who, whether they're born into it or whether they, you know, kind of finagle their way up to the point where they have surplus of something, then, mo- you know, the most uh, valuable surplus is going to be an energy uh, source of some kind. Uh, and then you've got the, the trickle down of the power structure. So you take away that concept of surplus at the top of the pyramid as far as resources needed in order to make power, to make everything else go. You've got a, a top down collapse of, of the entire system. And I think, I personally believe it's not a, that's not an apocalypse. Well, you know, by the definition, it's an apocalypse for one group. But it's not, you know, the end of the world. Um, we're plucky creatures, and I think it would take no time at all 
to rebuild things at a local level and then all those local endeavors meet up and start networking i think it would happen super quick not hoping for a devastation of some kind or a collapse of any kind but i think we'd bounce back quicker than most people feel i agree i think uh what we do best as humans is adapt and that's what's kept us here and kept us i guess if you want to call it the dominant species is we are very complicated and uh one of our specialties is, is adaption and, and i agree in, go ahead well i was gonna say and invention uh you know if if necessity is the mother of invention imagine how much we're missing out on innovation right now because nobody has necessity everybody's either been tricked into feeling they have everything they need or they or they actually do have everything they need and there's no necessity to be overcome through innovation uh, resulting in invention there's more necessity in the third world than in china you know because of their population strifes or whatever and then you've got more innovation happening outside of these borders than ever before good point definitely i think uh decentralizing the energy to touch back on that is uh, definitely what needs to happen. As, as you were saying, as you accumulate these resources, then you have to protect them. And now all of a sudden we've got people thinking about aggression and offense and defense and, and, and bringing a warring type of attitude into it. If you can replace that with the on-demand systems that you're talking about, then it's just like a water spigot. You just get it and, and, and you're good to go and you don't have to protect your resources because everybody can have them and, and even if and everybody can't have them, it's just a machine that draws the energy out. And I guess depending on what that machine would be, you would uh, either be replacing the battery part of that. I'm, I'm sitting here tinkering in my head going, well, wouldn't that just technically be the battery? Only it would be pulling the energy out instead of storing it. But on-demand energy is probably a lot safer than any type of storage if you think about like look just look at the radiation you know rods at fukushima practically uh, endangering the entire northern hemisphere mm. so yeah i agree decentralizing on-demand energy um and and uh, like the trifecta the solar the the tesla's working with a vacuum and uh wind generation Shit, they should hire us. <laughs> <laughs> the next show will be uh, a think tank show. I like we'll, that. We'll just start solving all the problems. Well, if not us, who? Right? <laughs> so we may need to uh, go back and talk about um, the ongoing effects of Fukushima, maybe hit on Chernobyl. I think that was mentioned, but we never really went back to uh, to address it. Well, there's definitely <clears throat> long-term effects on the uh, animal population. I think uh, Vice.com has a uh, series where they went <clears throat> into Chernobyl and talked to everybody about the animals, and there's definitely mutations going on. So that's something that can be expected in any, any animal that's going to stay on the northern part of Japan. Oh, yeah, they're already seeing, uh, you know, in some of the smaller animal life, crazy radiation, uh, distorted limbs and stuff. Now, during the uh, Chernobyl disaster, there was actually a, a flume of radioactive material that, uh, or a cloud, I guess, that was released initially that, uh, that went over a large area and contaminated a lot of land. Um, did that happen with Fukushima, or was that contained? Well, there wasn't a uh, a, a large event. Well, it wasn't a, a large event at Fukushima. These small little explosions due to steam. But Chernobyl was <clears throat> the initial event. Was a high energy event. Um, so I think more the amount of radioactive material, let's just say particles and smoke and dust and everything, that was released airborne by Chernobyl in that initial event, most likely is echoed in a seaborne emission, uh, because right now they're pumping in seawater, running it over the, uh, the hot material and letting that seawater go right back into the ocean to be taken up into the currents and dispersed. Right. So I think, I think you've got a mirror 
uh, of an ecological kind of uh, ramifications. When uh, Fukushima first uh, started to go into a, uh, a bad situation, you know, for lack of a better word on my mind at the time, uh, there were some workers that actually defied orders from Tokyo Power and started pumping seawater into reactor number four to keep it from becoming a Chernobyl-like event where you have the uh, radioactive plume released. Uh, whether or not that was effective, you know, that's all speculation. Um, but it's good that that didn't happen. Um, however, you know, I don't think we're going to see any indication of just how bad this is for, for decades. Um, you know, my thought is if, if you mess with the ocean, you're really messing with the whole food chain and the ecosystem of the planet. So, you know, it's going to be a, we're not out of the woods yet. It's going to be an interesting ride. Well, that's just a sit around and wait <clears throat> scenario. There's really nothing, nothing anybody can do about what's already been released and, and out there. Just like with the initial testing that they did in uh, Nevada as far as setting off uh, nukes. I, I believe everybody of a certain age has uh, radioactive um, particles in their teeth, in the enamel, or the calcium. Um, everybody's, everybody has it. There's just nothing you can do about it. Um, so we may, because this is more of an ocean and, and up the food chain kind of situation, we may start having latent radioactive you know, signatures in our body, but no, you know, adverse effects as far as what, you know, taking somebody down in a lifetime. Or maybe our, th our thyroids will just get more robust and learn how to deal with it. Yeah, we could use that. Um, they actually, how, mu how much concrete did they dump into uh, Chernobyl? I know it's a little bit different situation in Japan. They dumped a lot of concrete and a lot of materials into the Chernobyl reactor to finally get that contained, I guess you could say. They, they kind of buried it in a vault. Uh, what are they doing with uh, Fukushima? I haven't heard anything about a sarcophagus effort. And actually, there's universities right now uh, trying to revisit the Chernobyl sarcophagus and cap it off even more. So that one's not perfect. All right, let's uh, take a George Carlin uh, perspective at Fukushima for a second in related to his famous rant about plastic and how the earth couldn't create plastic itself, so it had us do it for it, and there's it needed it, and it'll handle it in its own way. Let's, for Wu's sake, say that in order to build a internet interdimensional or subspace antenna beacon that all this radioactive material had to be refined and clumped together in you know concentrated uh, areas and that goes with the ufologists uh, claim that the uh, the UFO um, situation really ramped up if not started with um, our nuclear testing and then they all of a sudden showed up and were very interested in it uh, perhaps the more <laughs> uh, Fukushima and Chernobyl uh, situations that occur, the more antenna we are building, and it's all in the goal of summoning something else to come in and uh, join the evolutionary process. My vote would be Cthulhu. Right on. <laughs> <laughs> I like it too. I voted for it too. Um, another, I, I see what you're saying. Kind of as we build for, as we go forward with our technology. I don't know if you meant literally, like by creating these different, combining these different uh, radioactive materials that, that we're literally building a, an antenna. That's you know that's possible because we're able to you know, read stuff on other planets and I imagine there are advanced a more advanced civilization that can probably read our nuclear stuff. Well let's just say everything happens for a reason on every scale. And if that's true then this is unavoidable. It's just, you know, do what we can to make sure there's, you know, not a lot of 
suffering from it, but maybe it's just a, a wave to be ridden. I agree. I don't. And, and speaking of scales, I, I don't think this is the first time uh, standing firmly planted in Wu Land. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about four former civiliz. God damn these headphones. Former civilizations and and you know their run with uh, different forms of energy and of course all the the talks in the um, the Indian Vedas and uh, the talk of and Atlantis. And that being that eventually, at some point, they had like a nuclear war, you know, because they're finding radiated stuff in the uh, Middle East and, and things like that. I'm curious if maybe some of the stuff that we're digging up and using as our energy, you know, the, the, the iridium or, or whatever it is, if that might be like toxic waste left over from those civilizations, you know, and as we mature and make our way up to the stars and the system begins again with new, you know, be it may not like humans or you know from the monkeys or cat people or dog people or whatever you know they'll go through the same cycle of digging up our toxic ways oh, this wonderful stuff that we can use for energy so i can see that you know being a continuation of a cycle and like i said everything happens for a reason i thoroughly believe that too i don't think there's any coincidence so yeah we're just gonna have to ride it out but i don't see any end to uh nuclear power I don't even though the two incidences of Chernobyl and Fukushima if you look at it should you know kinda jolt us out of uh, the haze we're in and say okay maybe we should try something different because you're not gonna stop earthquakes you're not gonna stop things of a magnitude that can't be predicted or, or you know uh, designed for there's always going to be Murphy's you know law hanging over your head so even though we can tell that this is something that we cannot control and when things go bad we just shove some dirt on it and you know treat it like a cat turd and just walk <laughs> away uh, that doesn't that doesn't seem to be swaying uh, the the forward movement of the technology or the, in the industry I should say the, the technology sees little tiny leaps and, and bounds but generally the equipment out there is you know older than me and it's all part of the supply chain you know they like you said they own or at least control the entire system you know the foundation that's not the right word. yeah the foundation like their entire they own the big machines they own the hardware they've got relying on hope you know like if everything goes right we're going to be just fine you know with taking into consideration what just happened in fukushima we're not going to be that lucky forever uh as far as using nuclear energy in the future um thinking of things like space travel where we don't have the natural resources necessarily we still have the solar of course there's no wind um and if we can get the, the tesla vacuum figured out that'll be uh, of course a replacement for for a power supply out there but I think we'll probably be seeing some of the nuclear stuff. I mean, basically, just take a look at a nuclear sub. They're going to take that, fit it for outer space, and that'll be our, you know, spaceships. Well, there's a um, a jet propulsion design that's out there uh, that um, NASA they had an initiative to kind of um, create more airports, smaller airports, uh, to fill in the gaps between the larger ones and to have more of an air taxi infrastructure than the uh, large movement of people that we have right now as far as air travel. And the heart of that concept was a uh, nuclear reaction based jet engine that would take a very small bit of um, I forget what isotope it was, but it was a very, very small amount, like something that would fit inside of a test tube. And it was bombarded by x-rays from an x-ray, you know, producing uh, mechanism all inside a uh, an area of a small, you know, jet engine. And the heat created from that reaction would be, I want to say, the propulsion uh, the the exhaust from that, but I'm I'm sure there's some steam and turbine involved in it. But it was a ver on a very small scale. So taking that uh, process and you know module modulizing it and placing it in you know uh, local areas and having a network of those, you have 
probably you know a fraction of the power capabilities of larger units or larger technologies but uh, a very low chance of something atrocious happening or misuse of the uh, the material like a, a, a to make it more easily regulated because you're using smaller amounts of the of the material, the isotopes, like you said. And the reaction isn't a, uh, it, it's not a, uh, you know, metal on metal, um, you know, close proximity, therefore fission is taking place. It was a much lower energy reaction. Much safer, for sure. But if it could propel, you know, be the power source for something on the, you know, scale of a, a, a you know, a small Learjet, then that should be able to produce enough power for a neighborhood. Damn. And then you just have to, you know, have a, a, an infrastructure built to maintenance and, and regulate and all that. Well, I know Toshiba actually came out with a self-contained nuclear reactor design, and I believe a uh, university in the United States, I'm not sure which one. I want to say Arizona, but I'm not completely sure. I would have to look it up. To where the safety uh, safety is based upon the internal design of the system. Safeguards are built into it. It's not using enough material to actually um, have a meltdown or anything like that. If it failed, it would just stop working. Uh, there's a town in Alaska that's actually purchased one of these. And uh, they're about the size of a refrigerator. And they bury them in the ground. And I believe I read one unit could power sixty thousand homes. And is that the unit? Is, is that the unit that's uh, almost like a solid state component where it, it you never take it apart? It just once it's built, it starts and just keeps on going. Yeah, basically, it's a disposable kind of system. Now the. The real problem with this is we're talking about high, high, high technology and, you know, particle physics and, and everything. However, the end result is steam. You're producing a very, very expensive high-tech source of heat, using it to make steam, and that pressure drives a turbine. Now, I'm not an accredited scientist <laughs> but shouldn't by now we be using something other than steam power to produce electricity well to jump back on the uh, thing I was talking about earlier not only uh, necessarily generating uh, energy but using uh, magnetics uh, in, in the mechanics of it to carry the load and do you know actually produce the work uh, you would you would be you know you wouldn't have bearings and grease and things like that you'd have non-touching parts for the most part you would, so you wouldn't have the wear and of course that cuts down on maintenance so, well if you're going to use magnets for one thing they'd have to be swept out eventually because they'd lose their charge at some point uh, and if you're going to go with magnets why not go with coral castle um, and the magnetic flywheel that I want to say Bob Green uh, had videos on where you've got a, a circle with the uh, North Poles angled at certain um, degrees, which apparently line up with the Freemason degrees of separation. And then you you have a gap and then a key, uh, key magnet, and then you've got some form of perpetual motion with uh, very low torque. And then you had uh, the Italian guys who had cartridges and tons of them lined up. And... I think in the size of like a 50-gallon drum, you had something with the uh, torque equivalent of a diesel engine. Damn. Damn. Yeah, actually, the uh, Toshiba design is the 4S, and uh, pulling up a diagram of it now, but it's very hard to make out. Uh, it doesn't involve, doesn't have any turbines. Um, it says that it works on a uh, fast neutron reaction that doesn't use control rods, but keeps the ability to shut down the nuclear reactor in the case of an emergency. It uses liquid sodium as a coolant, allowing the reactor to operate 200 degrees hotter than if it used water. Liquid salt, my God, that's cold. <laughs> <laughs> of course, if you dropped one, I don't know if you know if it broke, how, how bad it would, how bad it would break. 
We appreciate, we appreciate you. your five star rating and remember to join us next time on another lopsided discussion here on Bias Propaganda Radio.